So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today's uh, training is going to be on navigating mainstream benefits, CalWorks, and CalFresh. We have presenters Jessica Mark and Teresa Berra from Bay Area Legal Aid presenting on CalWorks, and Patricia Cervante and Claire Bell Chavez from Second Harvest of Silicon Valley presenting on CalFresh. Um, quick intro of myself. My name is Sadika. I'm from Home Base. We're a nonprofit technical assistance provider. We provide TA um, across the nation. We work closely with Santa Clara County's Office of Supportive Housing. And one of the many things we do um, is provide trainings on behalf of OSH, um, including this training on navigating mainstream benefits series. We're constantly looking to improve our trainings. So we will be popping in feedback forms about this um, specific training um, toward the end, um, just to hear folks um, to see what your interests are and also to tailor the trainings, ensure that you all are getting um, and understanding the topic areas that you wanna learn more about. And just for some quick um, Zoom housekeeping um, rules, we, in terms of tech, I know you all are familiar with Zoom by now, but just to let everyone know, we will be recording um, this training um, and the training materials will be sent out and posted to the CLC training website. So don't feel like you have to screenshot anything. Um, also, we're going to keep everyone on mute by um, default, but there will be time at the end to ask questions. Um, also, you can raise questions in the chat anytime, and I will be looking at the chat as, as well as the presenters to um, answer any of the questions that you may have. And if you have any technical issues, please email me directly at sadaka at homebasedccc.org, um, and I can help you out. And just to get everyone warmed up in the chat, if you can just put your name, organization, and if you're a night owl or an early bird, um, just so you can get familiar with the chat feature. And I will pass it on to Teresa and Jessica for the Cal Fresh. Let me stop share. Yeah, hi everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Teresa. I am an economic justice attorney with Bay Area Legal Aid. And I will be presenting today with my colleague, Jessica. Hi everyone. Sorry, I'm trying to share screen and uh chat with you all and I'm not good at doing two things at once. Uh, my name is Jessica Mark. I'm also an attorney at Bay Area Legal Aid. Uh, Teresa and I work on various government benefits, um, CalWORKs, CalFresh, uh, general assistance, and we're happy to chat with you all today. So uh, we're going to be, we're going to start off with uh, CalWORKs. Um, and then uh, our agenda for today, we're going to talk a little bit about the services that Bay Area Legal Aid provides, and then we're going to jump right into uh, CalWORKs. So uh, we're a nonprofit organization, and we provide free legal advice and representation in various areas. So one of them is the economic justice, which is the one that Jessica, Mark, and I um, uh, assist with. Uh, we also provide domestic violence prevention, housing preservation, healthcare access, consumer protection, and youth justice. So uh, there are several areas in the county that we provide our services to, uh, one being Alameda, Contra Costa, Marin, Napa, San Francisco, San Mateo, and then Santa Clara. So um, those who are eligible for our services are uh, low-income residents, and we look into uh, the federal poverty level. Uh, they have to be below 125%, which is about $18,000 uh, income per year uh, for one person with assets um, of no more than $50,000, and that's for one person. Um, we also do provide services to citizenship, uh, those who are um, have immigration status um, or citizens. Um, and this is due to the federal funding that um, we get. So um, we serve uh, 
U.S. citizens or nationals, lawful permanent residents, uh, and other immigrants with uh, legal immigration status, uh, victims of trafficking for sexual or labor exploitation, uh, victims of partner, spousal, or parental abuse. And uh, unfortunately, we don't offer, um, due to our federal funding constraints, we cannot serve uh, DACA recipients or other immigrants who do not meet. Uh, one of the criteria above. So in economic justice, we provide um, services such as advice, brief services, and full representation um, with denial, termination, or overpayment of CalWORKs, CalFresh, and general assistance. Um, there is limited help with Social Security overpayments. Um, but we do help with like some terminations and applications, um, and only if there's no other attorney that is able to take the case. Um, and then to get, um, to inquire about uh, getting some of our services, um, you would have to call the legal advice line, um, which the number is there, 800-551-5554, um, or the other 408 number. We do recommend that people call in early in the morning, um, right when the line opens, um, because after a certain amount of calls, we do close our legal advice line. So then we have to call the following day. And then as far as uh, the other service we offer is uh, domestic violence prevention. Uh, these services are for survivors of domestic violence and we help with immigration release and family law um, with services such as divorce, legal separation, annulment, restraining order, child custody and visitation or child or spousal support if it's connected to another case. Um, so we don't only provide services for child support or spousal support. And then the same thing, like um, you can call the legal, uh, the advice line for domestic violence, which is that number, that 800-888 number below. And then uh, we also offer housing preservation. Um, uh, the services we provide is eviction defense, uh, fair housing enforcement, including discrimination, uh, reasonable accommodation requests, landlord harassment and retaliation, housing authority issues um, that could include uh, vouchers such as Section 8 or transfer vouchers. Um, we do not uh, generally do anything if the tenant has moved out uh, or small claim uh, cases, damages, security deposit, and we don't assist landlords, including uh, master tenants or foreclosures. Um, and then to also see if we, uh, they can set you up with either an attorney or an advocate to look at um, whatever issue you may be having, uh, you do have to call the legal advice line, which is the 800 number um, down below. And then uh, healthcare access, uh, there's another service. Um, we assist with like Medi-Cal, Denical, in-home supportive services, covered California, um, managed care and HMO issues, medical debt, Medicare. So it's like all of this list here. Um, the services that we do not assist with are medical malpractice or negligence, um, personal injury matters, work of compensation, affirmative lawsuits against individual providers or hospitals, um, or convincing a medical provider to prescribe a service or medication. Um, there are typically for the services that we provide, there is no income or no assets limit. Um, and to, uh, to get help, you do have to call this other number. This is the 855-693-7285. To also see if they can um, schedule you for an intake call with um, either an attorney or an advocate. Um, there's like a, a block, so I'm not able to see it. But um, so as far as the consumer protection, um, we also provide uh, certain services for this. Um, this includes, uh, usually we only provide advice for this and it would be for the following issues such as information about legal rights and debt collection, uh, credit reporting, um, like if uh, you suspect some identity theft or course debt, um, any kind of debt related to domestic violence, 
um, inaccurate credit reporting, housing denials due to credit, um, or like eviction reporting, federal student loan, debt repayment, or discharge options, um, owner, home ownership issues such as foreclosure, home improvements, or sale fraud. Um, we do not provide services that relate to bankruptcy representation. Um, we only advise on that. Uh, tax product liability, personal injury, or child support garnishment. And then to get um, uh, some advice on this, we also uh, do recommend uh, individuals to call this legal advice line, which is the 800-551-5554. Um, you can also um, visit our website um, to see our clinics in San Francisco, Richmond, or Bay Point. And then uh, for youth justice, that's also another service we provide. Um, it's for young people between the ages of 13 to 26 years old um, who face homelessness, uh, foster care, guardianship, medical and mental services, service access, um, school, uh, public benefits, SSI, immigration, um, restraining orders, family law, foster care related housing or other civil legal issues um, such as capacity allows. Um, and then the services we do not provide for uh, this specific group is um, we only take SSI cases for youth connected to juvenile pro uh, pro probation. And then for this, um, we do ask that a form be filled out. Um, there's a link on here. Um, and after the form is filled out, uh, we typically will reach out within 72 hours to conduct an intake. Um, and then the youth must have consented to the referral prior to, to it being made. Um, and then the way we do our intakes is we prioritize youth at highest risk for juvenile or criminal system entry. Um, so we get those intakes and then we prioritize them based on um, those who are at higher risk. And then, um, so now we're gonna dive into the CalWORKS um, section of it. Uh, CalWORKS stands for California Work Opportunities and Responsibility to Kids. Um, this is a temporary assistance to needy families, also known as TAMP. Um, and this is a federal program providing cash aid to needy families with children. Um, California's TAMP program is called uh, CalWORKS. Um, and then CalWORKS is intended to be a time-limited transitional program to move people into employment. So uh, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, which is the TAMP, um, is a block grant. Uh, states have a lot of control over uh, what the program looks like. Um, and then CalWORKS is uh, a cash aid program for children deprived of parental support and their adult caretaker um, relatives. So uh, deprived is um, considered when at least one parent is absent, deceased, disabled, or unemployed. Um, and then there are uh, certain instances in which um, immigrants uh, do qualify um, for CalWORKS. And uh, this group of people would be um, LPRs, which is uh, those that have uh, legal permanent residency, um, also known as green card, green card holders, um, refugees, asylees, um, VAWA applicants with the prima facie case determination, T visa holders, um, U visa applicants, um, human trafficking survivors may be eligible uh, before filing the application. Um, Afghan, Ukrainian uh, that have been um, paroled um, or have been granted a humanitarian parole or a special immigrant visa. Uh, battered spouse or child of, of a United States citizen or legal permanent resident with a prima facie uh, determination. And then um, uh, though 
So who is the assistance unit um, when it comes to CalWORKs? Um, there are mandatory members and optional members. Um, so mandatory would be an eligible child uh, would be considered somebody under age 18 unless the child will graduate high school before turning 19. Um, eligible siblings or half siblings in the home, um, adoptive or birth parents of the child in the home. If a parent is a minor living with their parent, um, the eligible grand child's grandparent, then a grandparent must also be included. Uh, a sponsor of a sponsored non-citizen. And then an optional member would be like a step parent, other eligible children in the home, such as a grandchild, a niece or a nephew or a non-parent relative caretaker. And um, now uh, pregnant people are, are now eligible in all trimesters. So um, as soon as uh, someone becomes pregnant, they would be eligible for cowards. Um, SSI recipients are not unfortunately eligible for the coward. And then um, here are just a few examples of assistance units. Um, an example one would be like a, a mom, a boyfriend and mom's two kids, like four and 10 years old. Um, another example is mom, dad and three kids. Um, 10, 15, and 18 year olds. Um, and then the third example would be like a grandma and four minor children. So just to be clear in these examples, in example one, where the family is the mom, the boyfriend, and mom's two kids, the boyfriend isn't eligible for uh, Kyle works unless he's the parent of the two children, which the way it's written doesn't seem that he is. In the second example, where you have mom, dad, and three children, potentially all five of them are eligible, but it'll depend that 18-year-old on whether or not they've graduated high school yet, and if they haven't graduated, if they're on track to do so before they turn 19. In the third example, where you have grandma and four minor grandchildren, uh, honestly, we need more information. They could be an assistance unit of five, with all five of them in the unit. Uh, if the four children are all siblings, then they'll all have to be on the assistance unit and grandma can choose whether or not she wants to join depending on uh, whether or not it's beneficial. If she has income, she may not want to join, especially if she's like her social security may make them ineligible. Uh, in addition, if the children are, the grandchildren are cousins as opposed to siblings, then they can also choose who to include. Uh, siblings would all have to be in the same assistance unit, but cousins don't have to. Uh, and then from there, this is where I take over, right, Teresa? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, in order to determine financial eligibility for CalWORKs, we actually have two income tests, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the gross income and the countable income. And so before we can do the math, we need to figure out what income it is that we're gonna count. So uh, certain income just doesn't count at all. If there's SSI, any loans, if any of the children have money, they're not gonna count. Um, there's If there's a non-needy relative caretaker, that's not gonna count. Uh, and what that means is in the situation where grandma has four grandchildren, if grandma chooses not to be in the assistance unit, then she's a non-needy relative caretaker. If she does want to be in the assistance unit, she's a needy relative caretaker. And so if she's a non-needy relative caretaker, she's not in the assistance unit, they're not getting CalWORKs for her, her income won't count. If she is in the assistance unit, they are getting CalWORKs for her, her income will count. Uh, in addition, income that is not reasonably anticipated uh, is also not counted, and that's a term of art from the county uh, or well, for this, from the state. That means that the amount and the approximate date of the payment is uh, must be known in order for it to be reasonably anticipated. So the way that we see this is if people are working like in the gig economy or you have a job where your hours fluctuate, uh, you may have part of your income that's not countable because uh, you don't know how much it is uh, you don't know how much you're going to get until you get it. And so in that case, it wouldn't be considered countable until you actually receive it. Uh, in addition, this may also come up when someone is starting a new job. They might not know exactly when they're going to get paid or how much they'll get paid. <clears throat> 
excuse me, finally, income of an abuser that requires the abuser's permission to access is also not going to be uh, considered income in the CalWORKs program for a, a DV survivor. Uh, for CalWORKs, unlike any other benefit program, the state is divided into two regions. So we have region one counties that's going to include all the Bay Area counties, coastal counties, the nice counties, the pretty counties, the ones you might want to go hang out in. Region two counties are the uh, ones that historically had a lower cost of living. It's not really a great line to draw anymore because these hasn't been reevaluated in a long time. And uh, you know, cost of living has changed, but uh, the farm counties, the more inland counties, the like, I don't, I'm from San Joaquin County, so I can say like the dusty counties, the counties you don't necessarily want to go to, those are going to be region two counties. Uh, for this training, I'm only focusing on the income levels for region one counties, since those are uh, all of the ones that we serve. But just know if you do have a client who is moving like to the Central Valley, they may move from a region one to a region two county. Uh, so it, for the first income limit, we have the gross income limit. And so to in order to calculate this one, you're going to take the household's full income. Uh, you can take away $450 for anybody who's working. And then you compare it to this number here, which is called the minimum basic standard of adequate care, or the MBSAC or the MIBSAC. Uh, we have a lot of acronyms and benefits. Uh, as you can see, these numbers are really low. It's really hard to qualify for CalWORKs uh, because off top, this income limit here is really going to take a lot of people out of eligibility. Uh, as you can see for like uh, an assistance unit of two, that's 1476. If someone's working, that can go up to like 1925, I think is about where that goes. Uh, but it's still just really difficult for someone. Once you have done the gross income test, if someone's income does meet that uh, limit, then we'll need to figure out their countable income or their net income in order to determine whether or not they they qualify. Uh, so first we need to, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, I have a bit of an asthma cough going on uh, the last couple of days. Uh, so a, a part of my coughs. Um, so the uh, we're going to start with any unearned income. That's all going to count. If they have any disability-based income, then we can subtract up to $600 from that. That would be, uh, so SSI doesn't count, right? That person can't get into the household. But if there's someone on SSDI or state disability, we can subtract up to $600 of that income. And then if they're, if the person is working, if there's any remaining amount of that $600 disability-based income disregard, we can take that and divide it out. It gets kind of messy. If you have a case and you want me to help you work through the math, I'm happy to do so. You can send me an email. My uh, information's on the end of the slides. Um, but you'll take the earned income. If there's any $600, you will take that out, and then you divide the remainder by half, and that would be what their countable income is. And then you would apply it to this chart here, the maximum aid payment. Uh, these amounts are changing on the first, which I think is like Monday or something. I don't know. Coming up really soon, these amounts are changing. So for now, our table is really messy. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but uh, you'll first need to decide if your household is exempt or non-exempt. An exempt household is one where everybody, all the adults in the assistance unit are receiving disability-based income. That's going to be really rare because usually the disability-based income is high enough to make households in ineligible. Usually the only way you would see that is if, excuse me, you have someone on state disability. You're really not going to see it for someone on SSDI just because the amounts are too high. Uh, like it's, it's not impossible. It's just really unlikely. Uh, most households are going to be non-exempt, and so you'll take the maximum aid payment, and uh, so I have that here. You'll take the maximum aid payment, you'll subtract that countable income that we just got on from doing all that weird math, and then that'll determine their monthly grant. Uh, and these are the maximum amounts that someone can get. So for a non-exempt household with a family of four, they're going to get fourteen twelve today. And then starting on the first, whenever that is, they'll their grant is going to go up to fourteen sixteen. Uh, so it's not a huge bump this year. 
Uh, in addition, there is a resource limit within the CalWORKs program. It's $11,634 for most households. Uh, these numbers are really like uneven numbers and they'll continue to be. Uh, the, the way we kind of get here is the resource limits were really low a couple of years ago. They were raised and they raised it to $10,000 and then pegged it to inflation. So moving forward, they're always going to be this, these really uneven numbers. But ultimately, that is um, helpful for families because then ideally this amount will, will grow as, as the economy changes. Uh, but I've listed here some resources. The big one to note is if they have a car, there's an additional exception. Uh, and if that car is worth less than $32,000, uh, it's not. That, uh, and again, that's the equity value. So you would take the value of the car, subtract out any amount that they owe. Um, if it's worth more than $32,000, that equity amount then that uh, that's all that would count the amount over. So if it's worth $35,000, then it would only be about, I should have done, if it's worth $35,045, then it would be a $3,000 uh, towards the resource limit. Okay, and I actually am not able to monitor the chat. So I think I'm gonna pause here real quick. I, and my understanding is it creates a little box here. Um, so let's see. I see uh, pregnant and non-legal immigrant eligible. I need some more details, uh, but the those two things are not rel uh, related for CalWORKs eligibility. So if you're a pregnant person, you can be eligible, but you still have to have a qualifying immigration status. And so if you have if you don't have a qualifying immigration status, then no, you wouldn't be eligible even if you're pregnant. Uh, a pregnant person is counted as an assistance unit of one, and then they would be, once the baby is born, they are an assistance unit of two. Uh, I'm not intending to use assistance unit interchangeably. I uh, Assistance unit and household, I might, honestly, because they are pretty similar. I'm trying to draw that distinction. Uh, it is possible that you'll have people in the household, people like in the home that are not on CalWORKs. Uh, CalFresh is given to households as we'll learn in the next session. And you can have people that are in the CalFresh household that are not in the CalWORKs assistance unit. So I try not to use them uh, interchangeably, but uh, I am an imperfect person and I might have done so. So apologies if I do. And if I say anything that's unclear, please feel free to let me know. Uh, undocumented with a student visa be eligible? No, that's not a qualified immigrant. Uh, is there an age limit for someone who is pregnant that is eligible? No. Okay, keep your questions coming. I'll I'll pull up the chat again, uh, and then I will um, I'll 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 get back to the program, but I'll I'll check. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so how to apply? Someone can apply for uh, CalWORKs. Uh, I, I recommend buying online at benefitscal.com. Uh, that's going to be, I think, the least painful way of applying. You can also do so by phone or by going in person to any of your county welfare department offices. Uh, once the application is filed, you're going to have to do an interview. That usually happens over the phone. Uh, and you're going to be required to submit all verifications. And actually, this note about collateral contacts is a mistake. I um, meant to remove that. That refers to CalFresh. Uh, so I won't read this to you, but these are some of the sorts of information I may ask you to verify through the application process. Uh, the county can require you to verify information. They can't say that your verification has to take only one form. So uh, if they're, so for instance, they can say that we need to know what your income is. They can't require you to produce pay stubs, even though that might be the easiest way for you to verify. Excuse me. Regular applications should be processed within 45 days. In practice, they're actually usually processed around 30 days. Uh, the reason for that is most people are uh, applying for CalFresh at the same time, and CalFresh requires a 30-day processing time. Uh, but they're allowed to take up to 45 days. I see it sometimes, just not as often. Uh, there are immediate need applications, which can be processed within three calendar days. Uh, and that should mean within three days, you should get $200 or the full grant. I actually really simplified this. There are situations where they have to give you uh, some amount of money, either $200 
uh, or the full grant by the following day, uh, or like within 24 hours is actually, I think, the language. Um, but the longest it should take is three calendar days. And so if you have someone in an emergency situation, I do encourage you to request immediate need. And that's also something that if you need help with or you have questions with, or they're taking longer than the three days, uh, that's a, the sort of case that we really wanna see, immediate need cases that aren't being handled timely. Uh, and so you should definitely feel free to reach out to us. Uh, in order to qualify for immediate need, you need to be apparently eligible for CalWORKs. That essentially means that uh, if everything you've put on your application is true and can be verified, then you would qualify, but you haven't necessarily submitted all of your verifications. You have to have an emergency situation that can't be addressed with homeless assistance, which we'll talk about CalFresh or a community referral. Uh, your you can't have excess liquid resources. That means cash on hand. The amount varies based on the emergency, but it could be as low as, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it could be as low as $100. And then you must have complied with the technical requirements. That's the way it's written. Uh, you do have to verify your social security number before they can give it to you. They may ask you to apply for other benefits you might be eligible for. Uh, you will have had to do that. And there might be some other things such as, um, I'm actually forgetting, those are the big two. No matter how long they take to process your application, it should be processed within the, uh, the or excuse me, your benefits should be approved back to the date of the application if your application is approved. And when you apply for CalWORKs, you, would also, you should also get CalFresh and Medi-Cal if you're not already receiving them. Once you're on CalWORKs, in order to maintain your benefits, you'll have to do reporting. Uh, you'll have a SAR-7 um, or a redetermination. Uh, your benefits are going to be approved for a 12-month period, and then they're mostly frozen for six-month intervals. Uh, your SAR-7 is going to be due at the six-month point, uh, and that's a short report designed to capture changes to your income address and other basic eligibility factors, but not everything is reassessed at your SAR-7. A redetermination, on the other hand, is essentially like a new application. These reports should be aligned for CalFresh and Medi-Cal. CalFresh also has a SAR-7 and a, um, an annual redetermination for most households. Uh, Medi-Cal has a, an annual redetermination, not that mid-year one. Uh, these should be realigned uh, there if you received if you went on to benefits at different times, they might be off, but you should ask the county to align them. My understanding is they can, but they don't like to. Uh, but if you don't, then because you have these like six month intervals and these 12 month intervals, you essentially could be submitting reports to the county like every other month or so. Uh, and so it can be quite burdensome for people if they're not aligned. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. You have the right to file an appeal if the county is going to take an action uh, on your case that you don't want. You're uh, entitled to a written notice for any action that they're going to take. That notice should tell you what action they want to take, uh, why they're taking that action, the effective date, your appeal rights, and the regulations they're relying on to make that decision. Uh, and it should be specific enough that you're able to understand what it is that's happening and why it's happening. So it can't just be that we asked you to submit forms. It should say we asked you to submit this specific form number or we asked you to verify, you know, your income, something that's like specific. So you know whether or not that's true and whether or not you submitted what they asked for. Uh, if you disagree with the action they want to take, you have 90 days to request a hearing. You can get aid paid pending if they want to terminate or reduce your benefits, which means that your benefits would continue unchanged until that hearing is completed. If you lose a hearing, you may be asked to repay those benefits, so that's a risk some people might not want to take. Uh, you also have the right to request a hearing if they took an action without issuing a notice uh, or if they should have acted and they didn't. So if they didn't uh, decide your application within 45 days, you have the right to a hearing. Um, there's no penalty to, to requesting a hearing. So if you're like unsure, you should just file that hearing request and then you can always withdraw it if you learn more and decide that that wasn't actually correct. I recommend you file your hearing request online. The link is here. It's not a pretty link, but it is what it is. Uh, that is connected to the state hearing uh, like case management system. And so there's no like human interaction that's required. So that's the most foolproof way of submitting your hearing request. You can also
submit it to your county welfare department. And if someone is in a situation where they're considering appealing, you may want to um, either refer them to our legal advice line, or if you have questions, you can also reach out to us uh, for technical assistance. Once the appeal is filed, a county worker is going to be assigned to that case, and their job is to review the case and try to resolve it. So uh, they may offer what's called a conditional withdrawal, wherein the client agrees to withdraw your hearing requests in exchange for the county agreeing to do something else. That's how most hearings are resolved. Most hearings don't end up going to the judge. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, you can also do straight withdraw. Either you find out that you're wrong or the county fixes whatever issue. There's nothing left to be done. Then you can just withdraw the hearing. Uh, your decision is due 90 days after that request was made. We are seeing decisions take um, pretty much that full amount of time right now, I think. So your hearing is likely to be scheduled probably, um, you know, if 90 days is three months, I feel like your hearing right now is probably going to be scheduled about two months after you make the request or so. Uh, and that decision will come pretty close to that 90 day deadline. Uh, we want to make sure people know that CalWORKs applicants and recipients have the right to be treated without discrimination. They have the right to language access, disability accommodations, confidentiality, adequate notice. Uh, verbal denials aren't allowed. Adequate notice means that something in writing. A lot of times what we'll see, not a lot of times, but what we kind of uh, consistently see are people who don't have a qualifying immigration status will go, or people who do have a qualifying immigration status, but the county is wrong, will go and uh, try to get, they'll try to submit an application and the worker will tell them that they don't qualify. And so they won't even submit their application. Uh, that's wrong. People should go, they should submit the application, get something in writing. If they think they qualify and uh, the county tells them they don't, that's something they can send to us and we can look over. Uh, and, and, you know, that's the sort of case that we can take on and uh, see whether or not that's correct. Everyone has the right to file an appeal and everyone has the right to a legal representative. That doesn't mean a legal representative will be appointed for you. It's not like the um, it's not like uh, the public defender where an attorney is provided to you for free. But if there's someone that uh, wants to represent you, whether they're an attorney or not, you have the right to have that. Uh, and if you have questions, here's our contact information. Uh, and I will come to the chat. Okay, for those eligible to legal aid, can the victim of trafficking, trafficking be undocumented? Yeah, so the only exception to us being able to help people who don't have a, um, the, a, a qualifying immigration status are people who are undocumented and are victims of trafficking or victims of domestic violence or other violent crime in the United States. Like if you're familiar with, um, if you're familiar with immigration at all, people who might qualify for a U or a T visa or a VAWA self petition, we can take those clients at legal aid and those people also uh, likely qualify for uh, CalWORKs. If a father has legal status and the mother doesn't, will this affect the application? Uh, so in that case, the father and the children could receive CalWORKs, the mother wouldn't. Her income is uh, likely to be um, partially counted, uh, prorated to the household. If the member completed the CalFresh app, is there a simple way to add CalWORKs members to the CalFresh benefits? Uh, if they're already on CalFresh, they would have to do a new CalWORKs application. Uh, but if they're applying at the same time, uh, on the it's the same application. And so you can indicate there that you would just want to apply for all of the programs. If a parent doesn't have an immigration status, but the children are US citizens, does the household qualify? In that situation, the children could receive CalWORKs, but the parents wouldn't. In the same situation as before, uh, the parent's income would be prorated to the family. <coughs> Excuse me, could children who are American citizens, that's the same one. Oh yeah, contact info again. Let me just share screen to that last one. Uh, and we're happy to um, provide technical assistance or answer any questions to any of you. Feel free to reach out to us via email. Uh, please don't give our email to your clients. It, it can be too difficult to keep up with the volume of calls uh, that can come in. Uh, if you want to 
give our uh, if you want to connect us to clients directly, uh, please use our our uh, the eight hundred number. And then, can someone be denied due to receiving SSI? That happened to one of my members. Yes, if you're on SSI, you're not eligible for CalWORKs. And so you wouldn't be eligible, but other people in your household that qualify could be, you would just be excluded from the assistance unit. Okay, <laughs> that's all the questions I'm seeing. Um, I'll give it a, a second. Yeah, the slides will be shared to people. Can I chime in? Um, I'm the one that asked about the SSI. I do have some members with SSI that, have food stamps and then some that don't. Is there um, something that I might be missing? So food stamps is different than CalWORKs. And so so that's the next presentation is food stamps. I don't want to step on their toes, but you can be eligible for SSI and CalFresh food stamps. You're not eligible for CalWORKs and uh, you're not eligible for CalWORKs and for um, I'm sorry, what am I trying to say? You're not eligible for CalWORKs and for SSI at the same time. Uh, so I, um, my member was applying for CalFresh and she was denied on the basis that she had SSI, but I, I thought that was a little bit weird since I do have members with SSI and CalWORKs, not, not CalWORKs, CalFresh. Yeah, that's wrong. She should appeal. Thank you. I have a, a question. Uh, just a uh, second. I have a hand okay. here. Okay, Anil? sorry. That's okay. Uh, thank you, Jessica. I put a me uh, question in the chat. I just didn't catch if you answered it. I recently sorry, I helped. It. Oh, no worries. No worries. I recently helped a member apply for CalFresh. I was just asking, is there a simple way for them to also add uh, CalWorks to that benefit, or would they have to complete a whole new application? For CalWorks. Yeah, if they're already on the CalFresh, then it would be a new application okay. for the CalWorks. Um, if it's like still pending, you might be able to ask the county to consider CalWorks. Also, I've never done that before. Uh, if there, if it were, if you hadn't done the application yet, you can apply at the same time for both. Um, but if you've already done the application, awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. No problem. Okay, and then um, I can see that there's another hand, but I can't see whose that is. It's me, Mary. Go ahead. Hi, I have a question. So I know the GA um, program has a vendor payment program. We're having issues with our clients not um, paying rent. Um, so I wanted to see if CalWorks has a system where they could assist us with that so that we could have the landlord sign and the client sign and then the money gets deducted from their CalWorks and the check goes directly to the landlord. I've honestly never heard of a vendor pay uh, for CalWorks, but I, it's something I could look into and um, follow up with you on. If you can send me an email, then I can get back to you. I don't think there is, but I've never actually like looked into it, so I, I don't know for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maria Caballero, I see your question. Um, can you just explain a little bit to me? Sure. Um, my name is Maria Caballero, and I'm a case manager at a school. And recently, I got a case of a mom who is a non-citizen, and she um, had a really bad experience through sexual abuse, and she received a rape kit through the county, um, through a program. And now, unfortunately, because of the mental health and the trauma that she went to, she's not able to work. And I wanted to ask if she was able to receive some kind of services for her and her son so they don't, um, A, become homeless because at Santa Clara County, there's like a waiting list of six months for a shelter. And to, um, to see if maybe um, the child could at least qualify for food stamps. Um, excuse me. So, um. First of all, if she used to work, she may qualify, depending on what kind of work she's doing. Um, oh, you said she's undocumented. I was going to say um, unemployment, which is generally going to be higher than, or it could be higher than CalWORKs. But uh, if she's undocumented, I'm not sure she qualifies. Uh, so in that case, her um, 
yeah, so she actually might qualify for a U visa. Um, and so in, uh, she, she may qualify for CalWORKs. Her son, the citizen, definitely would. Uh, and her, the Cal for, the Cal Fresh same. Uh, so I would recommend that they apply the, if she hasn't actually submitted an application for, uh, Cal, for a UVC yet, then she wouldn't be eligible yet, but her child could be. Uh, and then also the note here about the Victims Compensation Board just wanted to raise that up too. That's another good referral. Okay. Um, I'm in the process of setting her up with an appointment for uh, a lawyer for her UA, for her visa because she oh, does great. qualify because of the um, trauma that she went through a couple of weeks ago. All I would need is the copy of the application being submitted for her to qualify temporarily for CalWORKs or she would have to receive her visa because it's like a seven-year wait. Yeah, no, she doesn't need the actual visa for UNT, uh, for a U visa, uh, you just, as long, as soon as you've submitted the application, you're eligible. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Uh, and I'm actually seeing, I uh, I think I made a mistake when I was making the PowerPoint and there are a couple of slides that I didn't uh, catch here. And so I just wanted to note for you all, I'll, I'll fix the materials that go out to you. But I wanted to note um, that like what you get when you're on. So CalWORKs is a cash aid program, but uh, sorry, let me just share my screen real quick. Uh, so Cal CalWORKs is a cash aid program, but there are a lot of supports that come. Uh, and so uh, first, I just want to note homelessness prevention. There are some homelessness prevention programs. Uh, there's permanent homeless homelessness assistance and temporary homelessness assistance that people can get. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there's disaster homeless assistance for families. If you have a natural disaster, uh, Santa Clara actually had one last year. Uh, winter with the floods. Um, but this can help people pay back rent. It can pay for temporary shelter like hotels. Uh, and it can help pay for some other um, things that can help people maintain their housing in order to prevent an eviction. There's also the CalWORKs Housing Support Program that varies more county to county, um, but that may help provide um, more targeted needs. It, it, it can be uh, so like the homeless assistance is really um, limited. CalWORKs housing support can be more whatever the family needs. So helping pay for like a, secu a security deposit if they need or moving costs or if they need like a, um, like I used to live in LA and we had a lot of the apartments that uh, didn't come with a fridge. And so we'd have to buy a fridge when we moved in. Home housing support could potentially pay for something like that. I also want to flag that there's diversion for people. If you um, have a short-term emergency, you don't need the ongoing monthly benefit, but you would benefit from having uh, like a lump sum payment, then you could potentially qualify for that. And there's family stabilization services that can provide like case management or something like that. And they can also pay for some costs related to preventing homelessness. Uh, I also wanted to flag that CalWORKs is limited, time limited for adults. It's only 60 months in a lifetime. This did recently go up from 48 months, but it's still, um, you know, five years isn't that long of a time. People can get this extended uh, for different reasons. The biggest one that we see is uh, dealing with the effects of domestic violence, um, but also just age, disability, uh, if you're, <laughs> excuse me, caring for someone things like that. Uh, while adults are being aided, they also have uh, to participate in work activity. They can be exempted from it uh, for different reasons. Again, the biggest one is going to be domestic violence. Um, but the benefit of participating in welfare to work is uh, really the supportive services that it comes with. So when you have a welfare to work plan, uh, that means that it's your plan with the county of how you're going to satisfy the, these work requirements, and that could be uh, that anything in your plan, uh, any services you need to do what's in your plan have to be provided by the county. So the big ones are going to be childcare, but I've also seen transportation uh, or um, ancillary expenses, and ancillary expenses really depend on what it is. So if you're in like a 
if you're in school, they could pay for your, they have to pay for your books. If you're in like a vocation training, like if you're doing like a chef school, they would have to pay for your like fancy knives. Um, I've seen it pay for someone's employment authorization card, the EAD for uh, non-citizens. Uh, anything like that, any expenses that come up related to your welfare to work, uh, excuse me, CalWORK should pay for. And again, the big one is childcare. That's like a huge expense that CalWORK should be paying for. Uh, and I think those are the, that's all of them. Oh, and the last thing I'll flag is the domestic violence waiver, which is available for survivors of domestic violence, can be requested at any time, and you can waive any program rules except for deprivation. That was that requirement right at the very beginning that you be, um, that you have, uh, what am I trying to say? Deprivation. One of your parents is out of the home, essentially. The income and asset rules are homeless assistance. And then people usually use it for the extending their time on aid. And uh, one of the big things that comes with applying for uh, CalWORKs is establishing paternity of your children and then participating in uh, or cooperating and helping the county uh, pursue child support against the other parent. If you're a DV survivor, either one of those things can put you at risk of harm. And so um, you can use the DV waiver to not have to do those things. Um, and Andrew, I see your hand. Yes, hi, Jessica. Hi. Um, I also work in the K-12 system. And so I just had a quick question for, I believe it was your previous slide regarding to employment. Um, and so I do support a work experience program here within the K-12 system. Okay. And um, in order to participate in our program, students must have a social. And so you touched on something um, that CalFresh, that's not necessarily a requirement. And I believe, and I, I know for a fact that we do have students who fall under CalFresh. So I was wondering if, um, as you mentioned, um, they support with giving the families they work with, with right to work documents to be able to earn a means of living. Um, do students that are being supported by that program per their parents, do they also receive that support? Or if you can elaborate a little bit more on what that looks like. Excuse me. So people who, um, not everyone who qualifies for CalWORKs will have a social security number or the right to work. There are gonna be people who, um, who, for instance, U visa applicants, I think, are going to be that big group. Also, if you're a victim of trafficking or, excuse me, a survivor of trafficking, then you qualify even earlier in the process. You may not have, uh, like, you can qualify while you're working on your T visa application. And so those are going to be people who aren't going to have employment authorization cards yet. Um, those are going to be people who aren't subject to the work rules. They would be excused, essentially, because of their inability to be able to work and so um, I think my answer to your question then is no, like the county wouldn't give them the right to work. I Would guess. it be case by case? Because we do work with students who do fall victim to some of those um, descriptions that you mentioned. So in the case, if we do have a minor who was a victim of sex trafficking that is undocumented, then would, there, would they fall in line for that criterion? So minors aren't subject to the work rules. It's only their parents. Okay, so they would remain undocumented. Is that my understanding? So I'm not an immigration attorney, so I can't speak to their immigration status. What I can say is that they wouldn't get, if they're not doing welfare to work, they're, they wouldn't get the welfare to work uh, like supports, like the child care and the um, paying for like your textbooks and things like that. Okay, so this, the services you're describing are specific to typically, in most cases, to the parents in the home or the adults in the home? Yeah, that, I, all cases. Those are all available cases. to the parents because they're, again, those specific benefits are tied to welfare to work and that only goes to the adults in the home. And the, the like very narrow exception is uh, like someone who's over 16 and stops going to school is subject to the welfare to work rules also. And so they, in theory, would also qualify, but that's a, like, that's a very small group of people. And usually their welfare to work activity is getting their high school diploma. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for that. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Uh, DACA recipients don't qualify for CalWORKs. And uh, yes, the does this mean they do not have to contact the father for DV victims or DV survivors? Yeah, they actually shouldn't. And so um, the 
<laughs> excuse me, if you're a DV survivor, you actually don't even have to list the other parent's name on your application. That's uh, There's been a couple of cases where um, mistakes have happened and the, the former abuser who is known to the county has been contacted on accident in some way. And so we actually would really recommend that, like, if there's any sort of risk of harm, if that, like, danger is still present uh, with this other parent, I would recommend you don't even give their information. And that's, again, definitely the kind of case that we would want to see if you're having any kind of problem with the DV waiver, if you're getting any kind of pushback on that, like, paternity establishment in a DV case. Um, you're saying that you don't want to give that other person's name and the county's like insisting that you do. That's definitely the sort of thing that uh, we want to see, but also we can resolve pretty quickly. And I'm sorry, uh, I was the one asking the question, the stage runner from Amigos. Um, with regards to that specific family, um, I just started working with them. So I'm able to build that rapport with mom. And so mom's been opening up a little bit more. She unfortunately has already opened up the CalWorks, was getting it for a few months. Um, and now she's trying to do child support with the father. Is there any like way that we could transition it to a DV survivor application versus what she had originally done, if that makes so sense. So she can, it, it's not an application. She just like needs to tell them that she's a DV survivor and say that she wants the DV waiver. She can ask that verbally. She can like send a letter in writing. There's no like required form or anything like that. There is a form she can use if she wants and I can uh, track that down and send you a copy if you want to email me. Um, but yeah, she just needs to tell them that she's a DV survivor. Is she doing the cal she's doing the child support through like the CalWorks as part of the CalWorks application process, you mean, or separately? To be honest, I think she got scared by the father and uh, took away the CalWorks and now she's only getting CalFresh. And so she's going oh, through yeah. child support. But unfortunately, there's no there hasn't been an outcome in the child support. They're just awaiting a um that's a court through like date. the family law case then. Yes. Okay. So the other thing to note is that if you are getting child support, the county will take that uh, and they'll use it to pay themselves back for the Cal Fresh. If there's any extra leftover after, or excuse me, not the Cal Fresh, the Cal Works, if there's any extra leftover after they've paid themselves back for the Cal Works, you'll get that. And they'll also pass through one to $200, depending on uh, what your situation is, like how many kids you have and all that. But um, they'll they'll take that. But one of the benefits to giving it to the county is uh, the county has more like they have it's easier for the county to force the other parent to pay. So if you're in a situation where that non-custodial parent isn't reliably paying that child support, but they're working, they have the ability to pay. They're just not paying it. The county can force them to, which may help you like in the long run, like you'll have if you're on the CalWORKs, you'll have more steady income. Uh, on the other hand, if that other parent is paying the child support and the child support is more than your cow works, it might be more beneficial to just get the child support. But that's kind of up to families to decide. OK, thank you. Yeah, but she should definitely get back on while this is pending. And again, that's definitely the kind of case that uh, we can help her out with and, and kind of explain and hopefully help to answer questions to help her not be um, afraid. I'm also seeing I'm over my hour, so I'll pass it over to our CalFresh uh, presenters so that we don't, uh, I don't, I, I don't want to take their time. Uh, if people have questions, we'll still be here, so you can continue to put them in the chat. You can also reach out to us via email. Always happy to help you all out, and, and I appreciate uh, you all having us here. Thank you, Jessica and Teresa. Um, I'm going to pass it on now to Patricia and Clarabel. Let me share the slides. Can you all see the slides? Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Clarabel, and I work for Second Harvest of Silicon Valley. And I am the medical coordinator here at Second Harvest. So we partner up with medical sites, and um, they get to send us referrals, and then we connect them to um, food resources. OK. Do I click or you click? You click, right? All right, so we're going to be going over our food programs. We're going to be going over CalFresh, basic CalFresh eligibility, 
dispel, uh, dispelling myths, unhouse applicants, and becoming an outreach partner. So who do we serve? We serve everyone, working families, individuals, seniors, college students, and unhoused community members. All right, so anyone can get our food programs. We don't ask for anything. We don't ask uh, for any proof of income, not even an ID. Um, we do serve Santa Clara and San Mateo County. And um, clients are able to go to any of the distributions that are most convenient to them. And they're not limited to just one, especially if they have bigger households, they can go to as many uh, distributions as they need. And then we also uh, offer two types of distributions. We still have a few drive throughs and we also have farmer's market style. So free food resources. So we have over 500 grocery sites throughout Santa Clara and San Mateo County. We try to give families at least 50% of fresh produce and 25% of protein and dairy. And a typical person will receive about 200 worth of free groceries a month. So what to expect at your first distribution? Um, so somebody will check you in. You should expect to get an assortment of uh, fresh produce, eggs, milk, meat, and pantry staples. Um, they will give you a card, and there's a tip that if you do get a card, to take a picture of it in case you lose it. And you can use that same card at most of our second harvest distributions. This is what a drive through site looks like. Um, you'll stay in your car. Um, somebody will check you in. And then you just open up your, um, what is it called? Oh my gosh, your trunk. <laughs> your trunk and then the volunteers will put food in, in your trunk and then you just um, drive away. Next. This is what a farmer style distribution looks like. So when we do sign somebody up for this, we just let them know that they need to bring some bags or a cart because they will be getting, they'll be getting to choose their groceries. And then we also not be able to carry all that at once. So you need a little cart or some bags to take it back uh, home. There are some that have pre-boxed items, but others, um, other farmer styles has, um, again, it gives you a variety of foods that you can choose from. We do have a list of uh, paired meal sites. Um, we do have this at, through Santa Clara and San Mateo County. And then usually this is for people that don't have anywhere to cook right at home um, or for those families that are living, you know, uh, multiple families under one household. And sometimes like the landlord won't let you use the kitchen. So we do have a list of that on our uh, website. Mm -hmm. So we do help with CalFresh applications. Um, a family of four can get about $973 in benefits. And we know that kids who um, benefit from CalFresh are 18% more likely to graduate from high school than similar low-income students. And we've also known, well, people know it as EBT, SNAP, or food stamps. We try to say CalFresh, but people don't know it until we say it's food stamps. And some people think that EBT is different than CalFresh. But... The EBT card is the actual card, but CalFresh is the program. And you're able to use your CalFresh benefits uh, anywhere, online, at participating restaurants, um, grocery stores, and farmer's markets. So we have a beautiful nutrition department that's also on our website. Um, we do have a lot of recipes that staff and both clients have given us. Um, you can go in there and, and add an ingredient and then all the recipes will pop up um, and you can download the recipes also. This is our food connection team. There's um, 
I think we grew already. I think there's like 20 of us now. We are all bilingual. If there's a language that we don't speak, uh, we do have the language line that we use. We are open Monday through Friday from eight to five. And I'll go over the food, like, lo food locator next. So we have a food locator on our website. So either you can become a partner and send us referrals, or if you don't want to send us a referral or you have someone in front of you that needs a location right away, you can go onto our website. You put in the day of the week. Um, I believe you can also click if you want to drive through or client choice. Um, and then all of the sites will pop up. It'll give you the schedules on there. It'll let you know what type of distribution it is. It'll also let you know if you need any um, documents. Uh, because, well, most of our locations, you don't need anything, right? But we also partner up with pantries like Sacred Heart, uh, Goodwill, Salvation Army, and they have their own specific, um, they ask for different things than, than we do. Sometimes they'll ask for documents, right? Like the proof of the children, ID, um, um, but we don't. So it will tell you on there if it's one of our sites or not. Next. Um, is this your part of the show? I keep going. <laughs> no, I can, I can take it from here. Okay. Thank you, Clarabel. You're welcome. Okay, so now I'm just going to give you a quick uh, CalFresh uh, overview. I did put the Nutrition Center um, link on the chat, and I'm adding also our food locator tool to the chat as well. Um, and what we want to do is we want to encourage people to use and combine both of these benefits. So we want people to um, apply for coverage benefits if they qualify, but then uh, com combine it with our free groceries, uh, free groceries program. So whatever they don't receive on the free groceries, uh, complete it with their CalFresh benefits. So just a little bit about what CalFresh is. Um, as Clara mentioned before, CalFresh is often confused. Um, when we say CalFresh, and not many people are familiar with, with what CalFresh is, so we do have to sometimes break it down to uh, SNAP, EBT, food stamps, uh, so that they know what CalFresh is. Um, so we all know uh, CalFresh is an electronic balance transfer who provides that provides food assistance to low-income households. Next slide, please. How to use CalFresh? Uh, CalFresh is used just like a uh, debit card. Uh, the card will have the client's name uh, and they can choose their own PIN number. Uh, they'll, they'll get a, a PIN number assigned to their card, but they can also choose their own. Whatever's left on the, the reminder of the card, the benefits will be shown on the receipt. And then any benefits left on the card will roll over to the next, uh, to the next month so that they don't, use, uh, they don't lose their benefits. Next slide, please. What are some of the CalFresh eligible foods? Uh, so all foods uh, is fit for human consumption, like fresh produce, canned items, uh, dairy, cereal, meat, poultry, fish, and also just learn that uh, birthday cakes are also uh, something approved for uh, with you know, that you can purchase with your CalFresh uh, benefits. However, some of these other items uh, for purchase, like hot prepared food, medications, vitamins, alcohol, household items, pet food or clothing are not, um, uh, will not be covered by the, by the CalFresh benefits. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, clients can now use their EBT their CalFresh benefits to do online purchasing. However, one thing to keep in mind is that some um, places now require a membership and the EVT benefit will not cover the whatever fee that they have. So if there is a fee for a processing fee or delivery fee, the client would have to provide a different type of method to cover for that fee. Uh, CalFresh would only cover uh, food, whatever type of food that they're purchasing online. Next slide, please. Uh, restaurant meal programs. Uh, so some some applicants can use their coverage benefits for to use them at restaurant participating restaurants. Uh, to be eligible for this, the eligibility is this, they have to have someone sixty or older. The person has to be sixty or older. 
uh, the person needs to have a, a person with disability would qualify if experiencing homelessness or the spouse of one of the above will be able to participate on the uh, restaurant meal program. There is a list of participating restaurants that qualify for this benefit. Um, and just to make sure that we're checking, you know, what the restaurants are participating because there could be a, a, a subway in the corner, around the corner of where they live that participates on EBT. However, not all subways participate on EBT. Same goes for Pollo Loco, uh, Jack in the Box, or Burger King, et cetera. Next slide, please. For those that have the uh, CalFresh benefits, so there is a market match where if they go uh, to a farmer's market, uh, they check in at the booth, uh, they can spend some other CalFresh uh, benefits, they'll get uh, vouchers, but then they get an additional uh, $10 vouchers to spend at the uh, farmer's market if need to. Next slide, please. And now we're gonna go into CalFresh elig eligibility. So there is uh, steps for when submitting a CalFresh application. So the first step would be to identify um, uh, the household, the CalFresh household. So we're, to do this, we're gonna ask series of questions. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first thing we wanna know is what is the household uh, composition? So what is a household? Could be a single individual. It could be a group of people that purchase and prepare food together. Uh, they would have to apply it all uh, in one application. Uh, we can find out more who should be included in the application by asking with how many people do you regularly buy and prepare food with, including yourself. Um, and we want to make sure there'll be times when you have someone applying for uh, coverage benefits and there'll be two families living in the same household, but not necessarily uh, or regularly purchase and prepare food together. So when we are talking to the families, we want to know, and they tell you, I live in a household of nine. We want to make sure that they all are purchasing and preparing food together. If not, then we can let them know that it's okay for them to apply as two separate households if they're not purchasing and preparing food together. Next slide, please who should apply together. So people who have to apply together would be children 22 years and, uh, and under living with their parents and married couples living together. So if they're a married couple uh, living together or if they are uh, children 22 years or, or under living with their parents, they must apply together with their parents. Uh, and people who can apply separately, again, roommates, individuals, or family who live at the same address but they buy and prepare food separately. And Jessica did cover a little bit about this. I'm just gonna reiterate again. So for immigration statuses, uh, who it's eligible for coverage benefits, um, at least one of uh, one household, uh, one member of the household needs to be either a US citizen, a lawful permanent resident, a refugee or as a Lee, uh, immigrant receiving an immigration relief through VAWA, um, a U or T visa holders, even if the application is still pending. And those are that don't have eligible statuses will be undocumented and authorized individuals, uh, feeling uh, felons or immigrants with temporary visas. This would include uh, DACA recipients. Next slide, please. So I have a quick scenario for you all. A married couple, Joey and Zoe, want to, uh, want to know if they can apply for CalFresh. They are both 21 and they have a, a four month old baby. They recently moved into Joey's parents' house. Uh, they both have jobs. They pay Joey's parents for rent and purchase and prepare their own food. They want to know if they can apply for coverage uh, under coverage benefits on their own without including uh, Joey's parents. What would you tell them? Would you say um, A, they'll have to apply with Joey's parents, B, 
they'll have to apply on their own. See a lot of A's, I see a lot of B's. So because uh, Joey and Zoe are 21 and they are living with Joey's parents, uh, the answer will be A, they will have to apply with Joey's parents. Um, even if they're paying their own rent, even if they're preparing their own food, they would still have to apply with uh, Joy's parents because they're not 22 yet. So the, the correct action will be uh, A. Next slide, please. Once you determine who should be applying together, um, then with the next thing we need to determine is the income. You know, what's the income that we're gonna be calculating to see if the households meet the CalFresh uh, income guidelines. So then we can ask them, what is your monthly income before taxes? What's your gross income? Next slide, please. So we have two types of incomes that uh, we use when calculating it. One is the earned income, uh, which includes wages from a job, self-employment, including rental income. So if there is, if you're helping a household that is renting their living room, another bedroom, uh, that would be count as income. Um, and also, of course, military income. But then we also have our unearned income, which includes state disability, child support, unemployment benefits, social security, and SSI. Um, workers' compensation, cash aid, call works, GA, uh, foster care pay, uh, payments, and better uh, benefits. So SSI recipients are eligible to apply for uh, CalFresh benefits. Income to be excluded would be non-monetary benefits in any kind, uh, loans, infrequent income, no more than $30 per quarter, uh, non-reoccurring lump sums payments, tax returns, scholarships, college grants, um, or any money earned by a child under 18 years of age who is still going to school uh, full-time, if they're still uh, going to high school and they're going full-time. Next slide, please. These are the income eligibility limits. Uh, these will change uh, October 1st. Uh, they will uh, grow up, uh, go up a little bit uh, for the gross income and net income. Um, but these are the guidelines right now till September 30th. And then October 1st uh, will go, uh, it will start a new uh, CalFresh eligibility income limits and it will go all the way to again, September 30th of next year. Next slide, please. The next step we help, uh, we want to help clients is uh, with deductions. So we want to think of this as when they're preparing, when you're preparing your taxes, right? The more deductions you have um, that go, can go into calculation so that we can get the most benefit for the client that we're assisting. Uh, next slide, please. These are some of the expenses that could be counted. Um, for coverage benefits. One will be, of course, house housing. If they're renting, if they own their own home, mortgage, property taxes, uh, utilities, uh, dependent care, uh, child care, medical expenses, and educational expenses for students. Next slide, please. For medical deductions, so medical deduction, any household in which someone is 60 years or older or disabled, uh, can deduct out-of-pocket medical expenses. So if your client can verify more than uh, $35 and one cent of medical expenses per month, they can get the standard medical deductions. So this would be medical, vision, dental care, hospitalization, insurance premiums and co-pays, uh, prescription and over-the-counter medications and or medical supplies, uh, hearing aids, eyeglasses, dentures, prosthetics, um, home health care, transportation to the doctor, pharmacy, or any uh, medical appointments, and cost of service animals or cost of providing meals to an attendant. So the goal is once we determine the income, the, the, the people in the household, 
the income earned, and then the deduction is depending on the people applying on um, in the household, we wanna get them closest, if not to the maximum CalFresh allotment, closest to it, okay? So the maximum amount for individual household of one will be $291. And then it goes up uh, and it goes on like that, right? 535, 766. And it's, um, it goes up depending on how many people are eligible in the household. And again, you wanna get them as close as the uh, maximum allowment uh, by asking all of these questions with uh, the expenses. We want to remind them if they have children and they, they say, well, I don't have any any expenses, but then you know that they have children, you wanna ask, are you paying for childcare? You know, like all those little things because um, all of this, uh, they can add up and help uh, the client potentially qualify for more on their benefits uh, when it comes to CalFresh. Next slide, please. Uh, once we we asked, you know, we explain what CalFresh is, how it works, uh, we, we determine if, if they're eligible, who's gonna be included in the application, who's preparing food together, uh, what is the income is, um, and the rent and deductions and everything. Um, we then put it together to then apply, uh, fill in the application. Next slide, please. So then we uh, review the process, right? We um, we outreach for coffers, we let them know what it is, we pre-screen them and we tell them about the verifications that need to be put together to submit with the county. Um, we submitted the application we tell, we explain the county process and contacts, uh, and contact the client, and then we let them know that they're going to receive an approval or denial of benefits within the next thirty days. Next slide. With um, everything that is going on, we always hear we there's always myths and fears, right? Um, I'm not going to cover each one of them. Next slide, please. Um, but I am going to cover, you know, I am going to go over some. Um, we are going to be sharing this um, and so that you'll have access to, to the slides and you can refer back to if you, if you need to. Um, but this is one actually that, you know, it came up with Jessica to do I have to pay CalFresh back? Uh, no, you don't have to pay any benefits back unless you, you were paid, um, you were overpaid. Sometimes we do see this when um, the client forgets to update the county with any changes on income. So uh, the client has the right um, uh, and obligation to let the county know within 10 business days of the change of income. So if there's a change of income where e either they stop receiving any income at all, you, they wanna notify the county, right? So that hopefully they adjust their uh, benefits uh, to go up a little bit, but also if they start making more money, they want to let the county know that their their income has increased so that they can adjust their benefits accordingly if they have to adjust it. That way they don't get overpaid and they don't have to pay the money back. Otherwise, yes, they would have to uh, uh, pay money back. Um, do coverage benefits roll over each month? Yes, uh, any balance remaining on their... Um, EBT card will be will roll over to the following month. They won't lose the benefit often enough. Uh, this be, this um, coverage benefit sometimes get confused with WIC, where with WIC you would lose the whatever you get for the month you have to use. Um, and so they sometimes it's, it's think that oh with coverage is going to be the same, but it's not the case. So if you have someone that is applying and they qualify for the minimum amount, which is twenty three dollars. Uh, sometimes people tend to get discouraged to apply for coverage benefits because they only qualify for $23. But um, I often try to uh, convince them and see how it, this is still very helpful. They can roll over the benefits to the next month. They can accumulate up to four months and then use the benefits if um, um, so that they, you know, they're getting, they're getting something. Uh, do you have to pay taxes on CalFresh? No, we don't have to pay taxes. Uh, CalFresh does not count as income either. Um, 
Do I need to show proof? Earning and our income must be reported. If you need help uh, getting documentation, you should discuss your needs with CalFresh caseworker uh, during the interview. So uh, Jessica did uh, talk a little bit about this as well. So yes, they have to, they have to uh, verify the income uh, somehow. Um, who can get CalFresh? So CalFresh, even if you get money from a job, a disability, unemployment, social security, call works, general assistance, um, uh, supplemental security income or retirement, um, you could still get apply for CalFresh. Even if you own your own home, you could still apply for CalFresh benefits. Next slide, please. Uh, can I get CalFresh as a college student? Yes. Can I get uh, CalFresh if I am not a legal resident or citizen to qualify at least one person in the household must be a legal resident or citizen, even if the person is a child uh, or sponsored immigrant by, may be eligible. Uh, can I get CalFresh if I own my own home or car? Yes, you can own your home or car and have savings and still be eligible for CalFresh. Um, will CalFresh hurt my, uh, my children's future? No, uh, it won't hurt your children's future. Your children will not have to serve in the military. We hear that a lot. Uh, your children will not have to pay the CalFresh benefits received uh, and the children will not be taken away from you. Um, these are old um, uh, things that we hear a lot when helping clients and that's what we have all compiled all together. Next slide, please. Will it hurt my chances to becoming a citizen? Uh, short answer, no. And the long answer, still no. Uh, there is this cool tool um, that we like to use whenever we come across a client that is it doesn't feel comfortable because of public charge, uh, when they don't feel comfortable in applying. Uh, we like to provide them with this link that you see here. Uh, so that they can, you know, they can themselves see, read through. Once they feel comfortable and they see, oh, yeah, you know, you're right, this is not going to affect me, and they want to proceed with applying for coverage benefits, uh, that they can, they can do that. And they don't have to, um, um, so that they don't feel forced to apply for a benefit. They, you know, we want them to be at ease when applying for this, for this benefit. Next slide, please. And for unhoused applicants, um, next slide. So who's considered uh, unhoused would be um, a person that has no fixed regular place to sleep a night, or if this person lives in a shelter, an armory, a welfare hotel, or if they live in a halfway house, uh, if it's living for less than 90 days in someone else's home, or if they leave um, somewhere that people do not usually live, such as the doorway, lobby, bus station, hallway, uh, car, or subway. Next slide, please. Uh, go back up again, sorry. <laughs> Can you, can you go back a little bit? Which was? It was uh, slide 46. 46, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Way too fast. Oh, it's going backwards. That's what's happening. Okay. Right here. There we go. Did it okay. skip again? This is that one right here. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So one of the, you know, for unhoused, you know, if they can get CalFresh, even if they live at a shelter and they're getting free meals at the shelter, they can still qualify, you know, apply for and qualify for CalFresh benefits. Um, they, if they don't have a place to cook or store food, uh, to they can still qualify for CalFresh benefits. Uh, Clarabel did mention our uh, nutrition center. So I encourage you all, if you are helping unhoused, to please visit our nutrition center. There is a lot of uh, cool features on our nutrition center where you can use the filters on the left-hand side of the 
uh, nutrition center and you can actually filter for recipes that don't require um, cooking equipment. And so there's a lot of cool recipes there that that you can share with um, with anyone that doesn't have a place to cook. Um, at a hotels, I recently worked with Amigos de Guadalupe at one of their hotels and we had a cooking demo um, for their residents that don't have access to, to a stove. Um, anyone who uh, be eligible for uh, CalFresh, any on house, uh, they're most likely eligible for expedited service. Next slide, please. So expedited service, uh, individuals may be eligible for emergency or expedited CalFresh if they meet one of the following circumstances. So if the household has less than $150 in gross uh, monthly income and it has $100 or less in liquid resources, or if the household monthly housing cost is more than their gross income, um, or if the household is made up of a migrant farm worker who do not currently have and are not ex expecting work for the next um, the next month to qualify for image, uh, expedited services. Next slide, please. Some special rights the CalFresh office uh, cannot force an unhoused client to produce an address. Clients can still receive benefits even if there's no fixed address. They can use the county address to receive uh, the NOAs are um, the letters and no SEMA annual reports. P, uh, people experience homelessness do not have to file a SEMA annual SAR 7 eligibility status report, but to get this exemption, the entire household uh, must be unhoused. Next slide, please. Special accommodations are for uh, people who are unhoused. Um, May use their coverage. May use their coverage benefits at certain restaurant and grocery stores to buy prepare meals uh, through the restaurant meal program. This is the um, the one we were talking about earlier. If an individual does not have an ID, the eligibility worker will assist the individual to obtain adequate documentation or identification. Um, the coverage eligibility worker can also verify the person's identity by calling someone such as shelter, worker, or an employer who can confirm their identity. Uh, voter's registration may be an easiest acceptable ID to secure as well. Next slide, please. Unhoused youth. So if there is an unhoused youth who are not living with their parents or under control of an adult, they can apply for coverage benefits on their own. Uh, the income of their parents must uh, not be included in calculating when determined eligibility. So next steps, what are the next steps for us? Next slide, please. So we do uh, have um, uh, what we call our open uh, team, which is the Outreach Partner Engagement Network. Uh, if you are interested in helping Second Harvest expand outreach throughout both uh, uh, the communities of Santa Clara and San Mateo counties, uh, the benefits for the agency would be uh, we'll specialize a training that would help you connect your clients to CalFresh or free groceries. You'll have access to a diverse partner network. Uh, you'll get outreach materials and support from us here at Second Harvest. Um, on-site coverage application assistance and on assistance with outreach uh, strategies and campaigns. Um, next slide, please. Uh, how do clients benefit from our services is we connect them to free grocery program referrals that work best for them. Uh, when applying for coverage application assistance, we provide them with post application support uh, we submit, we help them submit verification documents with the county. Uh, we help sometimes uh, have a conversation, a three-way conversation with the county. Um, and uh, we let them know when their interview is coming up so that they are prepared and ready uh, by the phone if they chose a phone interview. And information and referrals to other support services. Uh, so because of our network, our, our open team, 
we do have, uh, we familiarize ourselves with other agencies and when they uh, give us their information and the resources that they provide, we, we get a lot of calls coming through our hotline and we provide those um, information to the clients that depending on what they're looking for, what resources they're looking for, we give them um, a place to go to, to get additional resources that we don't provide. Next slide, please. If you are interested in learning more about this partnership, uh, you can uh, fill out the inquiry form and we'll be more than happy to uh, connect with you and talk to you more about, about this uh, if you're interested. Next slide, please. Any questions? There has been a lot of questions. I have been answering them, but if you um, still have questions, you can give us, uh, I mean, you can ask now. There was one about if the website WE accepts EBT. They do not. I just looked it up. People on disability can apply. It is income-based. Um, so if their disability is under the income guidelines, then um, under the income, then yes, they can still apply. Go ahead, Maria. Hi, um, gracias. Um, I have a question. I have I work a lot with um, low-income families who come into the country from different parts of um, the world. And um, some of them come um, with no employment, no income whatsoever. And I need to set them up with second harvest when it comes to picking up um, vegetables or food. Some of my students here deal a lot with mental health and especially um, where they cannot go on their own and go pick up food and stuff like that. I wanted to get more information of the program that you have within Santa Clara County, maybe um, when it's the preparation of the food or they deliver food for them. It's no, there is not uh, the preparing meals is um, a place mm -hmm. where they would have to go and get their meal there they can take it with them or they could eat it there at the facility. It really depends on which uh, site they get referred to. Um, you can use, you know, you could use our food locator tool and on our food locator tool, you could also uh, use the filters. And if, let me, if it's okay, let me uh, share, I'm going to share my screen real quick so I can go over the food locator tool sure. uh, with you all. Cause I think it's a great, um, tool to have. Okay, I just wanna make sure everybody can see my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you go to our Second Harvest website and uh, you go to get food or you go to the link that I provided earlier on the chat, um, you go to, uh, let me redo it again. You go to get food and it would give you the map. Here it is. And then here on the map, um, you'll have a lot of filters here on the left side of your screen. And you have free groceries, ready to eat meals here. You have to share your screen. Food. There we go. Uh, can you see it now? Yeah, okay. Um, so you see on the free on the left side of the screen, you'll see the free, free groceries, ready to eat meals. Uh, you have days that you, if you're looking for particularly a specific day, uh, times and then here you can enter the zip code or you can enter a full address if you want to find a more specific uh, closest location to you. Uh, you'll be able to filter if it's a drive through distribution, walk up, uh, things that don't require documents. One, one of the things with this is that we do partner with a lot of other agencies, uh, Sacred Heart, uh, Amigos de Guadalupe, Catholic Charities, right? And if some require documents, it's not necessarily for the food, it's for the other services that they provide within in-house. So if they, because they do have other services in-house, they do wanna know how many people in their household and they do wanna identify the people that live in their household, uh, but it's not necessarily because of the food. Um, so if I enter here a zip code and I'm just gonna enter uh, my zip code and I go next, you will start seeing all those drop pins drop uh, here on the right side of the screen. 
And if you click on the top right corner where it says map and list, it would give you the list of all the distributions coming up near that zip code. And these are just, I'm just searching general everything. I didn't specify groceries or ready to eat meals, okay? Uh, once you find the one that you think it would work for the client that you're working with, you go to the distribution, okay? And then it would give you information. So it would have here information for new clients, uh, what to bring for your first visit, uh, if you're interested in what type of languages they have there, uh, support, what type of distribution this is. Uh, it would give you the information that you're gonna need for this specific uh, for this specific site. Go ahead, Maria. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. And then most of our students come here to the school in the morning and then they leave. When you say evening, the latest, I think I saw it within uh, zip code 95127 was like 6 p.m. There's nothing later than that, correct? Um, I know that there's some, what, uh, what they, we do have weekends, and I, but I think, uh, yeah, no, I don't remember seeing anything later than that. Clara, you remember anything later than 6 p.m.? I want to say, I, I want to think if there is one. Um, I think there's one until seven. In the east right? side. Yeah. Okay. But okay. you just have to, if you don't see it, um, when you enter the zip code, just expand the, the search here, mm -hmm. Maria. Yes. Um, Expand the search there and it will give you uh, more radius of the zip code that you're choosing. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. You're welcome. Stop um somebody was asking about the oh my gosh the client can inquiry form be put on the chat so if you want to become a direct uh, partner of ours uh it will be it's on the presentation so you can um send us a request or email one of us and then we will set up a, an account for you we'll give you a link and then you can start sending us all the referrals that you want i'll um I'll add it to the chat too so that you have it. How easy. Can we locate it? And then let me, somebody asked about where you can locate the farmer's market style, the farmer's, sorry. How can we locate the farmer market food distribution style? So again, you could either send us a referral and then put in the notes section that the person wants a farmer style location, or you can go onto the food locator and then click on the farmer style and then those will pop up <clears throat> for you. Um, somebody asked, can one reapply after being denied? If so, how fast after denied application? So as soon as you get that denial letter, which is usually within 30 days, it should be within 30 days. Um, right now, I know it's the county is taking a lot longer to process applications, but as soon as you get that denial letter, you can apply right away. Uh, I would also just flag real quick. I'm so sorry to step on your guys' toes. This is a really good presentation. I hope I'm not annoying you. Uh, but if you have someone who is denied, it, but you think that's wrong, you can also appeal and that would get their benefits back to the date of their first application. That's the sort of thing you can refer them to legal aid for, uh, for help with too. Um, but also if that was right and things have changed, then a new application is also good. There was a question for immigrant families who fear receiving benefits due to immigration status, what can we tell them? So um, if you want to send us a referral, again, we can, you could put in the note section that they're worried about getting CalFresh. So we, when we call them, we'll be gentle, we'll talk to them, we'll give them, um, we'll let them know how it does not affect them. And then it's up to them, of course, if they want to apply or not. Um, but it does not affect their immigration um, status. And also, plus, if you're not a citizen or a resident, you're not going to get it anyways, right? So they shouldn't be worried because they're still not getting the benefits. It's going to be for whoever is eligible in the household. So you could say that. All of our um, all of our free groceries are open to all. We don't look at immigration status or anything. Um, so we can start with that, right? You know, so people can be at ease. And then again, when we get calls hotline and, and people are concerned uh, for this, for public charge and stuff, we always provide them the one link that I was talking about earlier that talks about public charge. 
And again, they can read themselves, they can see themselves and, you know, they feel more comfortable when applying for these benefits. Is there any other questions? Uh, Sadika, could you put our contact information on the screen? Thank you, Jessica. I see your comment. Yes, make people feel comfortable. It's okay, you know, to be scared, right? It's okay to be scared. Um, get your questions answered. And once you feel comfortable, go ahead and proceed with the benefits that are available to you. Oh yeah, we forgot that part, right? So since we are not county workers, we can be very <laughs> transparent and we can let you know why are they asking for this? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people get worried when we're screening them. We're like, how many people do you purchase and prepare food with, right? But there's like three other families under the same roof and they're like, do I tell them that they're there or do I just talk about myself? So we will um, we will guide them on uh, just just telling them how it is right so it doesn't matter if there's other people in the household they just want to know who you're purchasing and preparing food with we make it clear on why they ask certain things we also let them know um, if you can't get this document that this is what you can do there's affidavit letters right that you could always replace any kind of document um, and then we just um, um, we just let them know what they're what to expect and why they're asking for things and we can be transparent i love that about our job because sometimes you're not sure what to say right you feel like you're lying when you're not lying but yeah so we'll get them ready for that patricia you all had another question about student eligibility uh, it says, I have a client, which is a student, only receives CalFresh for three months, summer only. Uh, how does the person fix it to receive an amount every month? Thanks, Jessica. I see. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> um, I actually, um, so for students, there are exemptions that need to be met. Um, so if the student, if they either approve for, if they have to, to some of the exemptions are either to be approved for uh, Cal Grant A or B, uh, approved for work study. Um, my mind is going blank. If they're working twenty hours a week, if they're working they twenty hours, give you the ones. So, yeah. So if they, if 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 your student does not have these exemptions, this is why they would qualify for the three months instead of uh, the month to month benefit. So they need to, as a student, and that's one of the, the things we often see is that if students are um, hard to, for them to receive CalFresh benefits because of uh, the, all of these exemptions. So to go, to fix that, you know, to receive it every month, the, your student needs to have one of these exemptions, uh, Hannah. Anna, you, uh, you're from West Valley, right? I can send that to you. I want to make sure I have the right Hannah. Okay. All right, Hannah, I'll connect with you. Uh, go ahead, Maria. And then I see. Um. So I'm um, sorry. Thank you. So when you say students, um. Our school is a high school. Um, it's a high school for um, undocumented students as well, and most of our students come uh, as asylums, as students crossing the young adults crossing the border. Could they also qualify for the service? Um. So thank you for mentioning the high school. So this this uh, students we're talking about are for a uh, higher education. So these are college, uh, university students. Um, for high school students, if they don't live with their parents or a legal guardian, they can apply for college benefits as long as they meet the immigration status, the eligibility for immigration status. If they applied for their asylum within our school, 
all they need is a copy of their application and maybe they could qualify. If, if, if they already have their approval notice, yes. Because it's a different uh, process than the U or T visa. U T visa, all you need is proof that they submitted an application. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I see Hel Helenia. Hi there. I just Hello. wanted to ask, I heard, I just missed the beginning of the student, college student, ex, as you said, they have to have one of three exemptions. Was that the Cal Grant A or B? Was that two of them? Yes. And what was the third one? Uh, work study. Work study. But if they work more than 20 hours a week, they may not qualify? No, no, no. So if they need to have one of those exemptions Okay. Um, in order to not have to work 20 hours per week. Oh. Otherwise, yes. Otherwise, I'm sorry if I, so they need to have one of those exemptions. And let me see if I can pull them up because there is more exemptions. Um, they need to have one of those exemptions to not be required to work at least 20 hours per week. So it's wow. either 20 hours per week or 80 hours per month. To work 20 hours per week or 80 per In month. In order for them to qualify for coverage, uh, for coverage benefits, yes. Got you. That makes sense. Okay. So I don't know, but if they do work and they're making income, but you know, the cost of they're paying for their own apartment, the cost of rent, you know, the cost of going to work that could lower their income enough. They could qualify still. Correct. So as long as they're working, so if they don't have any exemptions, but they're working 20 hours per week, yep. um, they can just call us and uh, we can help them. We pre-screen them and see if they have the income guideline uh, qualifications. Okay. Um, we do partner with a lot of schools, San Jose State, Santa Clara, Skyline, uh, San Mateo College, Mission, Green, Evergreen, like all the schools around the Bay. Right. Uh, and all of the schools around the Bay, they do have our link, our intake form. Perfect. Um, so that the students can reach out through, to us through there. And we can help them apply for college benefits. And like Jessica mentioned too on the chat, if a student has one of those exemptions and they were denied, we can always appeal. Because okay. I mean, we, mistakes do happen, right? Like we, you know, sometimes mis mistakes are um, are there. So now, if they do have one of the exemptions and they do work as well, do they consider their work income or not? Yes. Ah. Mm hmm. And work, they have to, they still have to declare the income. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate You're that. You're welcome. Any additional questions? And this can open up to both um, CalWorks and CalFresh if you had any questions for the presenters today. If no, no additional questions, thank you all for coming today. And thank you to Claire Bell, Patricia, Teresa, and Jessica for presenting. Really appreciate you all taking the time to prevent, um, to present on CalWorks and CalFresh. Um, and then for folks who attended today, I put in the chat um, a feedback survey that we would like to get some feedback on today's presentation. And Again, like I said in the chat, all of the training um, materials and the recording will be posted on the COC website, and I will announce it on the SPN COC listserv. Um, thank you all for coming today, and hope you have a good rest of your day.